Hello, and welcome to this video for Physics 131 on thinking about the connection between velocity and position using algebra. Let's begin by thinking about the point of this particular video. If you go to your goals and objectives document for your preparation for Unit 1, you'll see that one of the goals is to learn how to use the relationship between average velocity and position to solve problems on the motion of objects. In particular, for problems undergoing uniform acceleration, which means that the acceleration always has the same value and points in the same direction, you can use this relationship. Now, I know we haven't spent a whole lot of time in preparatory materials thinking about the direction of acceleration. We've just been thinking about the definition of acceleration as terms of the difference in velocity over the difference in time. We'll spend time talking about the direction of acceleration in class because it's sometimes a little bit subtle and can require a little bit of thought. So we'll thinking about, think about the direction of acceleration in class. But even though we haven't discussed that yet, we can already start to go to that next place and say, OK, if the acceleration is uniform, always has the same value, say it's always, I don't know, 5 meters per second squared or something, and always points in the same direction, then what happens? How does the position and the velocity and the time of travel relate? Now, what might be a good example of something with constant acceleration? Well, there's a few simple ones. You can imagine a rock falling to the Earth. We'll see later that this is a case of uniform acceleration. You might also think of some sort of animal getting up to speed from rest, usually those accelerations are fairly uniform. Or you can imagine a car that's going along, but slowing down for a stop sign. We'll see that this also can be modeled with uniform acceleration, with an acceleration pointing backwards in the direction of motion of the car. So all three of these scenarios can be modeled with uniform acceleration. So it's not just some theoretical construct that we're thinking about. OK, before I get too far, I know that many of you have taken a physics course at some point. And if you have, you've probably seen these three equations. Now, I want to point out that the first one is really just the definition of acceleration. So if you look at acceleration, the definition of acceleration you recall from your reading is Vf minus Vi over T. So if I multiply both sides by T, those will cancel. And I'll get At equals Vf minus Vi which will give me, if I add vi to both sides, will get me the expression you see there. Maybe different symbols, but the equations are definitely the same. So I don't want you to think about this as some new equation. This is just the definition of acceleration that you already have been exposed to in your preparatory activities. These other two equations, we're not going to use. If you know them and you're really comfortable with them, that's OK that you use them on an exam. But I'm not going to give, you, give them to you on an equation sheet because I don't want you to use them. Why not? Well, these equations tend to encourage students to think of physics in terms of a bunch of equations that I have to put together to solve a problem. And not, as is a goal for this course, as a set of ideas. See, this is an idea because it's the definition of acceleration. These equations, on the other hand, you have no idea where they come from. How, why are they true? How do they 
relate to each other? How do they relate to the other ideas are, we've been talking about? When are they true? When are they not? All these different ideas. So I don't want students to be thinking about that way because I want you to learn to think of physics as ideas. Now, I will, of course, be adjusting the problems accordingly. So instead of thinking in terms of these equations that you might have seen before, we're going to approach it in a different way. So how are we going to approach it? This is best demonstrated by some sort of simple example. So let's say you're averaging 60 miles an hour down the highway. Are you necessarily doing 60 all the time? Well, no, of course not. You might be doing 65 for a while, and then a little bit later, 55 for a while. You know, your speedometer is always going up and down. As you go up hills and down hills, you'll speed up and slow down. But it's totally possible that you average 60 miles an hour. Now, this question might, this next question might be seem somewhat trivial, but I want you to actually think about it because we're going to translate our thought process into mathematics. So how far did you go in an hour? Well, if I'm doing 60 miles an hour, how far did I go in an hour? Most of you can probably say, well, I went 60 miles. Straightforward enough. But how did you get there? I want you to now think about how you got there in terms of the physics ideas that you've been exploring in your preparatory activities. So if, say, let's build a model. Let's build a model that we have a nice straight road. Does this ever happen? Sure, in Nebraska, you can totally have this. So we've got some nice straight road with some little car on it like this, and it's driving down the road, and we're averaging 60 miles an hour. Let's use our physics terms. The change in the x, so let's say this is x equals 0, start setting up a coordinate system. Positive x goes that way. The change in x in that one hour is 60 miles. Okay, so far so good. The time, now you'll recall, I will often write delta t as just t. The time that we travel is one hour. And we averaged 60 miles an hour. So we have an average velocity of 60 miles per hour. What did you do in your head? And let's translate that into a symbolic representation. So to get the answer that you just sort of intuitively knew, you said, OK, I take my average speed, and I multiply it by the time, and that gives me how far I went. That's it. That's all you did. So we have now developed using our understanding of the ideas of velocity, time, and displacement. We've developed a relationship that hopefully makes some sort of intuitive sense to us, as opposed to these two equations, which probably don't make any intuitive sense to you, even if you have taken a physics class in the past. So now we have an equation that should make some sort of intuitive sense and connect to the world around you. Okay, great. How can we use this? Well, let's go and think about another example where we start at rest and accelerate uniformly for five seconds. In that time, you travel 30 meters. What was your final velocity? Well, we now have this idea that the distance I travel, or the change in my displacement, is going to be my average velocity times my time. All right, so that means I can very straightforwardly get my average velocity. My average velocity is then 30 meters divided by the 5 seconds gets me 6 meters per second. And that is my average velocity. OK, that's my average velocity, but that's not what I want. I want the final velocity knowing that I started from rest. 
So I started from rest. I want to know my final, but I do know my average. This is where we stop and we think, well, how do I get an average? An average is a mean, right? It, it, I add up all the things and I divide by the number I get. And it turns out that if you have constant or uniform, I will use both words, acceleration, then your idea of how you might calculate an average, like we do with data, will still work. You can still say that your average velocity is going to be your initial velocity plus your final velocity. Add up the number of things you have and divide by two. I mean, think about how you would normally calculate an average. Normally, it's the number of items you have. In this case, we have a final and an initial. So n would be two. And then you add up all your data points, right? Add them all up, divide by the number you get. That's how you calculate an average. We're doing the exact same thing, adding up the initial and the final. Those are the two data points we have. And we divide by those two. So now we've just connected two ideas with our everyday experience. We've connected, a map can be helpful sometimes to help show the connections between all the ideas in physics. We know that average velocity is always the change in x over the change in time. This is just the definition of velocity of average we also know how to calculate an average so to calculate an average we know how to do that with experimental data for example what you do is you go all right i add up all the things i got and divide by the number now, in the case of constant acceleration, and only in the case of constant acceleration, this will totally work. What are my two points? The, in, the initial speed and the final speed. And I've got two of them. So bringing all of these ideas together, average velocity and average in two points, I get that the average speed is going to be vi plus vf over two. And I can combine this and this to solve problems like the one we're just talking about. So let's finish up the one we were talking about here. So I know the average velocity, but that's not what I care about. I want the final velocity. But now I know how to calculate, how to relate average velocity and final velocity. I do it this way. So let's put it all together. So we know average velocity is still delta x over t. It always is. That's the definition of average velocity. So that's coming from here and from our intuition of understanding of how average velocity works. Now we know average velocity is vi plus vf over two, because we know how to take an average. And so now let's put these two things together. We have a system of equations, substitute that into there, and we'll get vi plus vf over 2 gives me delta x over t. So 
What else do we know? If we go back to our problem, we see we start at rest. What do we mean when we start at rest? We mean that our initial velocity is zero. That's what starting at rest means. So carrying that along, we got Vf over two. Whoops, delta x over t. So Vf is going to be two delta x over t. Putting in my numbers, notice I solved in letters first. That will be a big theme of this course. One of the goals is to learn how to solve problems symbolically. We'll get a lot more practice with that in class. Two times 30 over five gives me two times six or 12 meters per second for a final velocity, and that's my final answer. Now, a few other things to note. I don't want you to memorize this equation either. This only applies in certain situations. This will only be true if this is equal to zero. Will it always be? No, here it is, but it's not always. What is always true? These ideas on this map, average velocities always change in position over change in time. And I know how to take an average. And then I put those two ideas together. And that will work every time, as opposed to trying to come up with solutions that only work some of the time. So that's how I want you to approach these problems. Again, I don't really want you using these equations that you might have seen before. Again, if you know them, I'm not going to you know, fail you for using them. But I, want, I would appreciate if you tried to approach it with a new mindset of thinking about the ideas. That concludes this video.